Oh, wow. Western River Expedition Buffaloes? <laughs> those, it's not going to work out. You're probably going to have to put those in Living with the Land. So, oh, how's it going? Hi there. I was just looking at the, some concept art from the history of the Disney parks. Nothing too crazy. Just some Western River Expedition stuff. You know, the usual. But this is my office. I can do what I want. Okay, okay. Maybe there was some Jungle Cruise concept art mixed in there. Maybe some Tarzan's Treehouse. But it shouldn't matter. I'm a grown man and this is my YouTube channel. I can look at whatever concept art I want to. In fact, no. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at all these old pieces of concept art and just dissect old pieces of Walt Disney World and Disneyland concept art so precisely that you would think I was crazy for wanting to do it. But I'm not. I'm not crazy. What is a Disney theme park without art? It would be Elitch Gardens, that's what it would be. Concept art is a way for artists, imagineers, builders, and yes, even us guests to get an idea of what something is going to be like when it is built, when it is fully complete. Ideally, not all the time. Remember this little ditty back from when we knew they were building a Guardians of the Galaxy attraction at Epcot? This was supposed to be the queue, the pre-show room for that attraction. Obviously, that didn't happen. But that's not me throwing shade at the Galaxarium. Okay, the Galaxarium is my favorite part of that ride. I just think it's interesting to look back at pieces of old concept art and see what Imagineers had in their heads at that time. And I know I'm kind of showing you pieces of like Epcot and Tiana's Bayou Adventure concept art, but I want to travel all the way back to the very beginning, to the master plan of Walt Disney's original Magic Kingdom. The original plan for Disneyland. Oh, that's the one. That's the one right there. Look at Fantasyland. Let's let's start with Fantasyland, okay? Zoom in on Fantasyland. Interestingly, the castle, instead of being at the very front, was at the very back of Fantasyland. You would still go over a drawbridge to get into the sort of courtyard area, but the castle was farther removed from Main Street. No idea what was going to be inside the castle, and I don't think it was important back then. I think they just knew they wanted a castle, but the carousel actually remains pretty much in the exact same spot. It didn't move. It was perfect. The carousel was exactly where Walt wanted. They didn't move it at all. It's a bit of a different story for Disney World, but we'll get there. Another attraction that made the transition from concept to reality pretty much unscathed is the Captain Hook's pirate ship restaurant chicken of the sea what 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 who cares trick question I do and it will forever be the chicken of the sea pirate ship at the back of Fantasyland today we can find Dumbo the flying elephant flying around and around and around where Captain Hook's chicken pirate ship used to be parked or I guess docked. Okay, moving on for a second from the Disneyland master plan you know what I like to do in a lot of my videos it's whine about Tomorrowland. And there is a lot to whine about, believe me, I know. I've been to two of them. Nothing gets my brain more imaginative than looking at these old pieces of Tomorrowland art. Like, look at this old proposed entrance to the land, it's insane. You can tell they were really leaning into the whole city of the future thing. It looks like there's an entire futuristic metropolis back there in the back of the land, although it's a theme park, this is Disneyland. It was most likely gonna be forced perspective and the attractions would be around the futuristic city. In fact, that concept was so good that they revisited it for the opening of Walt Disney World in 1971. You can see the city is almost exactly the same, and the two rocks sort of differentiate it from the two futuristic pylons on either side, which we did end up getting at the Magic Kingdom. Not the same, but close. Which oddly is way different from this piece of Magic Kingdom concept art that does not feature the pylons, but does feature some cool water fountains and a boat driving by? Again. We'll talk about that in a second. I am very excited to talk about this specific boat. Back to Disneyland for a second though, we can see the rocket in the main plaza of Tomorrowland, the Autopia, or it would eventually become the Autopia back there in the corner, that sort of stayed. But you can tell even based on this original concept that Walt and the people working to help build Disneyland weren't really sure what they wanted Tomorrowland to be. Even up until opening in 1955, they weren't quite sure whether it was going to be a showcase of the future, a sort of simulation of the future, a city of the future. Instead, it was sort of all of them all at once, and it didn't really work out very well until the old new Tomorrowland opened in 1967. But as we all know, the 90s wreaked absolute havoc and mayhem on Tomorrowland, and it hasn't quite been the same since. This master plan is just proof that there will always be some sort of problem at the Disney parks. The lack of good food in Fantasyland and Tomorrowland, the shortened Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room show at the Magic Kingdom, and of course, Tomorrowland. It's always Tomorrowland. It's always a problem. Bring back the people mover. Moving ahead to the only non-Magic Kingdom style park ever opened by Disney at that point in time, 
Epcot. Boy, there is so much Epcot concept art, both new and old, of course. And we'll start at the back of the park with the very interesting and never built Denmark Pavilion. You heard me correctly, Denmark. Now the whole Denmark Pavilion was going to be a first to its kind, very interesting collaboration between Disney and Lego. If you didn't know, Lego, both the company and the brick, originated from Denmark. And like all the other pavilions in the World Showcase, it was going to feature landmarks and food and performances from that country. And like other pavilions, it would also contain an attraction, which is where the Lego collaboration really came into play. The attraction would be sort of recognizable to those who frequent Disneyland. It would be a slow-moving boat ride, points there, through miniature sets, very similar to the Storybookland canal boats. Except these wouldn't be sculpted realistic miniatures, these minis would be made out of Lego. Very similar to the mini lands you could find at different Legoland parks all over the world. And you can also find, you know, not minis, but they're there at downtown Disney and Disney Springs. Another interesting fact is that the Denmark Pavilion was also going to contain a sort of miniaturized Tivoli Gardens, an amusement park that is found in Copenhagen. But interestingly, Tivoli was one of the original inspirations for Disneyland. We've talked about this before, but the cleanliness of the park and its use of lights everywhere at nighttime, how the park almost became something new when the sun went down was very inspirational to Walt when he built Disneyland. It was a place where you could, yes, go to enjoy attractions, but also go and just enjoy being at Tivoli. And I'm sure a lot of you understand that just being at Disneyland or Walt Disney World, just enjoying the atmosphere is just as enjoyable, if not more enjoyable sometimes, than the actual attractions. So the Denmark Pavilion was sort of a cool way for Disney to go full circle and pay respects to the original amusement park in Denmark that inspired Disneyland. Lego was to be the sponsor, aka pay for, the entire pavilion, but unfortunately that fell through and the Denmark pavilion was never built. Now we don't know where the pavilion was supposed to be located, but it was featured somewhere on this master plan drawn up by the incomparable Rolly Crump. Also interesting to note here, take a look at those bridges cutting through the World Showcase Lagoon, a sort of shortcut. You can also see it had four structures on them. I'm not sure whether these were going to be pavilions or if they were just gonna be sort of in between, almost like Odyssey restaurant sort of experiences. But now we move forward to what was then known as Future World, the sort of futuristic innovation technological half of the permanent World's Fair that Epcot Center was designed to be. More specifically to the Science and Invention Pavilion. Wow, this is a throwback to 1955 Disneyland if I've ever seen one. Now, information regarding this pavilion is extremely hard to come by and there are only two pictures of it known, the outside and the inside. We can see here what seems to be an Omnimover attraction through various space-themed environments, space stations, actual space itself, and something tells me I'm no Disney expert or anything, far from it, but this eventually became what we know today or what we knew as Horizons, you know, before it was replaced by that vomit simulator that we have today. The technology pavilion would go on to eventually become Horizons, which would become Mission Space. And for those of you who are bitter about Disney sort of chopping up Future World and divvying it up into little neighborhoods, world celebration, world discovery, world nature, for the new Epcot plan, may I show you this piece of concept art, or should I say just a concept plan for what Future World was going to be in the planning stages of Epcot. You have various different neighborhoods celebrating different aspects. You have technology, you have the arts, you have communication, all very similar to what we're seeing world discovery celebration and nature become today. It was all part of the plan, even back in the 70s, I think. We'll talk about a few more canceled Epcot projects and a few more pieces of concept art before we move on because dang, I could talk all day about it. And I might, in the future, not today. Here we have the 1978 miniature of Epcot and you can see some things that did end up making the cut. The World Showcase Lagoon, the Land Pavilion, although it did swap sides, Spaceship Earth, and both Communicores. Meanwhile, back in the World Showcase, instead of the American Adventure at the very back, we have some sort of display, a fountain shooting up into the sky, that's pretty cool. We have an Australia pavilion, while other pavilions that we do have today, France, China, sort of Africa, remain. Plans, sponsorships, what was feasible, what wasn't feasible, all of that would continue to be ironed out until the very next year, 1980, when we got this plan for Epcot. And basically, 
everything here is what happened on opening day. And by basically, I mean leaving out Horizons and the Living Seas, this is pretty much exactly what it was. Those two would open at a later date, but they were still planned. So now you've seen the 1982 Epcot Master Plan, now we're gonna move ahead to the 2019 Epcot Master Plan. Yes, this one is actually less accurate than the last one I showed you from the 80s. And specifically, in my opinion, the worst casualty of the cutbacks made to New Epcot, the new Festival Center. Now I know back when it was revealed, a lot of us were hesitant about the garden on top of the Festival Center because JPEG was in charge at the time, and we all knew he'd probably charge extra for special viewing of Harmonious from that rooftop garden at nighttime. Not a very cool thing for Bob to do. But just even having that rooftop garden open, even if it were just during the day, to just go up and relax and look out over the world showcase, I feel like it could have added so much to Epcot, and I'm so, so sad this was canned, although I do understand. And we are keeping Communicor around as an exchange, sort of. We don't get the Mushroom Festival Center, but we do get gardens on the ground, and we get to keep the Communicor name, so classic Epcot fans, we're all happy about that, right? We're all thrilled that Communicor is sticking around. But that's enough Epcot for now, because we're gonna move over back to California to Disney California Adventure. Now before it was California Adventure, it was known as Westcott. The concept was gonna be sort of an Epcot on the West Coast. Obviously that didn't happen, and if you want to learn more about that concept art and go really in-depth, I have a video right up there for you. But we're going to be focusing specifically on California Adventure for this video, before it turned into the budget park that it ended up becoming, unfortunately. One concept for Disneyland, actually, across the Esplanade, can be found at California Adventure on Buena Vista Street, Rock Candy Mountain. A lot of people know about Rock Candy Mountain, but I just figured it was worth a mention because it was a precursor to the Matterhorn that didn't end up being built because sun bleaching is a thing. So after Westcott, Michael Eisner and the rest of Disney settled on California Adventure, and this is what the entrance was supposed to look like originally. Note the monorail still going by overhead. I do find it interesting that they kept around, at least at this phase, the pylon, the giant spire from the old Westcott concept, but ju they just moved it into Sunshine Plaza. Here we have a bit more of an airborne shot. You can see Disneyland Drive right there with the Disneyland Hotel, the Grand Californian, Grizzly Peak, looking a little weird, and again, the spire is still there. Here we have a 3D piece of concept art called a miniature showing a little bit more of a realistic take on California Adventure. There is no spire, and you can see Paradise Pier there. Hollywood Land, Sands Tower of Terror, no, no Tower of Terror yet, and of course Grizzly Peak and the Grand Californian. But this parking lot right here is where we would today be able to find Cars Land and Avengers Campus. See, back then it was Bountiful Valley Farm, which is referenced in Avengers Campus, by the way. But going even further back before the Golden State Spire, we have this piece that shows us what Hollywood Land was going to be. It appears to be almost a one-to-one -one recreation of Hollywood Boulevard from Disney MGM Studios, now known as Hollywood Studios all the way down to the replica of the Chinese theater as the weenie of the park, the best weenie of Hollywood Studios, may I add. But don't worry, it looks like the red car trolley did end up surviving the changes over the years. Good job. And the last one, just for fun, is this piece of the Surf City Wipeout Coaster at Paradise Pier that would eventually end up becoming, yes, California Screamin'. But notice the launch, while you would still go underneath the bridge, you would also go underneath the bay. See how it's coming out of the water there? Just imagine if they kept that underwater launch, sort of in the same way that Big Thunder Mountain in Paris goes under the rivers of America. I don't know, I feel like it adds a really nice kinetic aspect to the ride. And But that's not me saying that Pixar Pier isn't already extremely kinetic with the fun wheel and the Incredicoaster and the Silly Symphony Swings and everything else going, adding to the feeling. But what's interesting to me isn't the coaster itself, but what's behind the coaster? Have you ever wondered what was behind the Surf City Wipeout? Oh yeah. We're going there. Let me give you let me give you an example. Okay. So Josh, do you ever wonder if you could travel to the other side of Big Thunder Mountain, what could be there? Friends, have you ever wondered what's behind Big Thunder Mountain? Do you ever wonder if you could travel to the other side of Big Thunder Mountain, what could be there? Gina, do you ever wonder what could be there? Do you ever just wonder that? Do you ever wonder? Tell me, do you wonder? Do you ever wonder? I do. Last year, the parks panel at D23 Expo got a resounding, uh, it was fine. I, I mean, eh. Because instead of closing out the show with a giant announcement, like we're bringing back the people mover to Disneyland, 
they ended with some things that may end up maybe becoming a thing in the far, far future. If you're really lucky, maybe we'll see this at the Disney parks. Probably not, but there's a possibility. Now everyone, the, the logical side of me knows that it's absolutely 100% pointless to try and pick apart and analyze these absolutely blue sky, hypothetical, not even very coherent pieces of concept art. But the Disney fan in me wants to be a little stinker today, so that's what we're gonna do. You know, you travel past the Old West, you go down south, you get to Mexico, Coco, fine, sure. You go even further south from Mexico, you get to Colombia in South America. Sure, that's fine, acceptable. You go even further south from Colombia, from the, from the Encanto land, now you get to um, Chernabog's Mountain, uh, uh, Maleficent's Castle. I guess that's where the villains live in the, in the South Pole, would be my guess on that theme. So it seems at the exit of Big Thunder Mountain, instead of turning right to head back toward Tiana's Bayou Adventure and the rest of Frontierland, you would be able to turn left into a small Mexican village meant to represent Santa Cecilia, which is where Miguel is from in the movie. It's where the movie takes place. Where guests would be able to wind up a hill, I assume in a queue of some sort, to the mausoleum of Ernesto de la Cruz, who was found at Oogie Boogie Bash. That's a... Fun fact for you. And again, lots of assumption here. We would go into the mausoleum and that is where the e-ticket or the, the attraction would be where we would go into the afterlife, into the spirit world. Maybe riding on the back of some magical alebrijes while we explore the world of the dead. I feel like that'd be a cool e-ticket. And as we move back, you'll notice the details get more and more scarce. We arrive at Encanto Town and there's not much to go off of here. You have the casita, you have a little bit of the town around it, but that's about all we can see for Encanto. And then you keep going past the casita, you arrive at some dark woods we have to traverse to get to Maleficent's castle, and even further back, of course, Chernabog's Bald Mountain. See, now, here's my take on this whole situation. I know we already have a Mexico pavilion at Epcot, the second best Disney park ever made, but, I mean... <sighs> I think Coco as an expansion to Frontierland fits very, very well, and it's definitely the most fleshed out out of these three concepts. That being said, the villains area is what I would be most excited for. A villains park has been rumored for so long, and the fact that Disney sort of came out and said that, yes, we hear you, we know you want villain stuff in the parks, not just after hours events, it shows that at the very least they're listening to us and they know that everybody has been clamoring for a villains themed land or park. Encanto, I think, is the weakest of the three, not because I hate the movie or I hate the idea of an Encanto attraction or anything, it's just because Coco would blend so seamlessly into Frontierland, and everyone's always been asking, for as far back as I can remember, before offhand Disney was even a twinkle in my eye for a villain's area park land, what have you. I would put Encanto in the e-ticket attraction bin, you know, just sort of like a Mystic Manor style trackless dark ride, taking you through the house and the, the, the different rooms, things coming to life, that sort of thing. But to make it almost its own land, I, I don't know. Uh, but hey, never underestimate the Imagineers. I think a lot of the, the reason for the muted reception for the 2022 Parks panel was this was supposed to be Disney's big answer to Universal, right? They know that everybody, including offhand Disney is going to be going to and extremely excited for Epic Universe and this was their chance to sort of tell us what they were planning on doing to sort of stand up to that. Instead of doing that, they just gave us everything through 2024, ending with Tiana's Bayou Adventure and then saying, maybe we'll do some stuff behind Big Thunder Mountain. Nothing at Disneyland, but maybe we'll just do some stuff behind Big Thunder Mountain, call it a day. I don't know. What do, you, what do you guys want to happen? What do, what do you want me to do? What do you want us to do? But now that Bob Iger is in charge, Chapek is gone, maybe the window is widening. Maybe the budget books are being opened a bit more, and maybe we will see bigger expansions to the park. Probably not a fifth gate, but maybe, maybe expansions, maybe new rides. Hopefully Disney continues to invest in their current theme parks. I think that's the right track for now. Maybe a decade down the road, we can start talking about fifth gates. Although I'd love to be proven wrong. Wait, 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 I got it. Epcot 2. Epcot 2, just do Epcot 2. It's, it's, it's perfect. The last piece of art that I wanted to show you for this video was this concept for the Storybook Land Canal Boats where the ride would end with Monstro vomiting you out. Thank you all so much for watching. I am gonna go to the end card now. And have you ever wondered what's behind Monstro? I don't know. That, that's up to, that's, that's up to you all. Remember, I said we're going to the end card. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this video where I talk about some canceled plans and some plans that were just concepts in this uh, art, concept art video.
If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, and if you're new around here, you want more videos diving deep into the history and secrets canceled projects of the Disney parks, hit the subscribe button because I have plenty more of those stashed away if you're interested. A very big thank you, as always, to all of my supporters over at patreon.com slash offhanddisney. They are the ones, my friends, who keep this channel afloat. They're the ones who keep this channel chugging along like a well-oiled monorail. If you want to join their ranks, please head over to the link in the description. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, patreon.com slash offhanddisney. And even just $1 a month will get you access to most of the perks, including being able to watch videos much like this one. And by much like, I mean this one. Early, a day early, compared to everybody else. Sometimes, sometimes a bit earlier, sometimes you, 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 you get it the day early. You can also follow me on my other social media accounts at Offhand Disney on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. It's the same across all three of those. It's, it's just going to be the same thing. If you want more Offhand Disney goodness that you cannot find here on YouTube. And that's about all we got going this week. Thank you all so much for watching. I got a, a Disneyland trip planned for next month for, for throwback day. That'll be fun. If you're there, make sure to stop me, say hi. And then it's, it's just Orlando until I drop. So I'll be going to Walt Disney World plenty of times over the summer. So I, I will see you all if you're there. I'll see you there. If not, I will see you right back here on the Offhand Disney channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye.